Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, okay, but uh, otherwise you can just uh, listen along or uh, read along with us. And as we uh, celebrate our uh, Christmas celebrations, and again, uh, there are only uh, two books in the Bible that speak about the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew is one and Luke is the other. So it's like every other year I kind of go back and forth. This year it's going to be Matthew. And there are a couple of things that I wanted to point out to you specifically about this birth announcement of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ related to uh, who and what he is that all of us uh, should well understand so that ultimately we give great appreciation for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so as we talk about Matthew's gospel and what he said about the birth of our Lord, he is speaking from Joseph's perspective, as it were, where Luke is talking about from Mary's perspective, gives a little bit more of her storyline. But here we see what Joseph was dealing with at this time and then all the events that went on around it during the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, uh, verse 18, from there down to the end of the chapter, and then in chapter 2, it gives us some specific detail in regard to this birth announcement and the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're going to uh, note and understand. So let's start off in chapter 1, and again beginning in verse 18. So in verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as followed. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. So again, they hadn't come together in the final uh, marriage ceremony, therefore not having sex, as you can imagine. But ultimately, now she's found being pregnant. That was gr quite a shock back in the day. And ultimately, uh, uh, typically, he would do something about that, as we see, put her away secretly, not embarrass her, but ultimately uh, continue on so that they could both go forward with integrity. Now in verse 20, it says, But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And that's from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. Now in verse 24, And Joseph arose from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took her as his wife and kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And we also see that in Luke's gospel about calling him Jesus as well. But we also see something different that is given to us in the book of Isaiah about the name of Jesus Christ. And when the angel gave this great announcement, <coughs> Joseph first and foremost was concerned regarding her pregnancy but the angel came to him and appeared to him and said don't worry about it this is all according to God's plan and as we've seen the rest again the Holy Spirit working with Mary ultimately now creating in the womb of Mary the babe child that would become our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and as he came forth from that birth ultimately you know he came forth as a man he came forth in humanity but what we don't uh, what we don't forget is that from eternity past, he already existed, not in humanity, but what? As God. And that's why we have the name Emmanuel given to us in the book of Isaiah. And that's what that name ultimately means to us, that now that Jesus Christ has come into the world, we understand from the name Emmanuel, which is a Hebrew name, transliterated now into the English and ultimately the Greek, then into the English. That name all by itself does mean God with us. But first and foremost, we see a name that is given, and that is the name Jesus. And what's interesting about that name, as I have up on the board, it comes from Yahashua, that then we contract down to the name Joshua, that ultimately now in the Greek and as it was given to Jesus is the name Jesus himself. 
And when we go back to the Hebrew, when we look at that name all by itself in the Hebrew language and the meaning of it, it does mean Savior. So the name that was given to this person that came forth from the womb of Mary is more than just a name. It actually speaks about who the person is. It's a title, and it represents what he would accomplish while he was here on planet Earth. And now when we think of the name Jesus Christ, we think of a title like I have a name, Jim Ricard, okay? And we just think that's the name of identification. But his name meant something specific, something specific about what he would accomplish here on planet Earth. And that is to be our Savior. And that's who he is. And so that's the first thing we pull out of this text that we see in regard to the Joseph storyline of the birth of Jesus Christ, that this person that came forth from the baby would be our Savior. And that's also what we recognize when we go back to the Old Testament and all the prophecies that were given about Jesus Christ coming into the world. Going back again to the book of Isaiah, but in chapter 45, in verse 21, it says, Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from of old? So again, eternity past. Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? Again, God is the one who has given these things to the Israelites. He gave them this information, and he's given it to the world. And what does he say? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. And that's why Jesus Christ, when he came into the world, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one individual that we can come through salvation through. That is the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we also see in these texts that were given to the Old Testament saints something very important, that it's not just a man that came into this world that is our Savior. It is who? God himself, a righteous God and a Savior. So as the prophecies came forth about who the Savior would be, they were telling of old that it would be God himself that would come to the earth and become the Savior. And again, for many people, that was a hard thing to understand and recognize. How can God, who is you know, all-powerful and uh, invisible to us, now come down to become a man and ultimately pay for our sins so that we could have salvation? Well, God found a way. And he found a way through the virgin birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through Mary, that virgin birth, when he took on humanity and then entered into this world. And that tells us something about him. He is our Savior, but he is also our God. And that's the important aspect of our Lord Jesus Christ, that our God is our Savior. And there's no salvation through anyone but through him. And God told us that from eternity past. In the book of Hosea 13.4, it also says, Yes, I have been the Lord your God since the land of Egypt, and you were not to know any God except me, for there is no Savior besides me. So again, another passage that tells us that our God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, ultimately is our Savior through the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is no Savior besides me. Our God is our Savior. And that's a very important fact that we all need to understand and recognize. And as we go now back into verse 23, in verse 23 it says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And it's interesting that in the New Testament, the Greek of the New Testament, this is the only time that that name and that word, Emmanuel, is used in the entire New Testament. And it's in the birth announcement of Jesus Christ coming into the world to calm Joseph's fear so that he would recognize what is happening around him and ultimately not put Mary away, as it were, in that day. And instead, continue the process and become the father, as it were, the earthly father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse 23, we see the birth prophesied hundreds of years earlier in the book of Isaiah. And we see Emmanuel, God with us. And again, just another fact for trivia, if you like facts of trivia, only two times in the Old Testament is that name used. And both in uh, the book uh, of Isaiah. And we see that coming forward in a fantastic way. 
that Emmanuel is used. And then one other time in the, the book of Isaiah, we have the word im, which is the root for Emmanuel, and then the word el, which is also the Hebrew word for God. So im el, God with us, is what is in view. So Jesus Christ was given that title by the angel so that we could recognize who the person of Jesus Christ is. And then when he would complete that work of living the life as our Messiah, as our Savior, he would then go to the cross and pay for our sins and take on those sins so that ultimately we could have salvation. And our God did that for us. He took on humanity, he became like us, and he paid for our sins so that we would not have to and then give us all the grace blessings that come with the payment of the penalty for our sins. He died for our sins, and our God is our Savior. And then once again, therefore the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. And that's even a great song we have, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us. We have that song. And we recognize that and re we remember that each and every day. So in that prophecy, again, Jesus Christ, we have the title. Call him Jesus. Call him Savior. Call him Emmanuel. Call him God with us. What are we calling him? God with us who is our Savior. And that's who Jesus Christ is. And that's why he came to earth 2,000 years ago so that he could pay the penalty for our sins. Now, continuing on in the birth story, let's go to Matthew chapter 2. And then uh, in, in uh, verse 2, we're going to see, again, another title that is given to him that is also very important for the understanding of who and what Jesus Christ is. And here the narrative's a little bit longer, where it says in verse 1, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king. Again, he was the king during that day. Again, the puppet king of the Roman government, as we know. It says, Behold, Magi, or we say wise men from the east, arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And again, another important title that is given to this person, Jesus Christ, but also relates back to his deity. Because way back in the Old Testament, way back at the creation of man, way back at the creation of the nation of Israel, God said to them, I am your king. You have no other king. I am your king. Even though they wanted kings, and we see kings coming into the fore in the history of Israel. God was always their king. So that, too, has given us a great understanding of Jesus Christ. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? It says, For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Kind of curious. Oh, no, the king's coming. We're in trouble now. Okay, what's the problem there? All right. It says, In gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them, with the Christ, again, we see that uh, name being also given to us, the anointed one also recognizing the Messiah, where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and this is Micah, as we've noted, and behold, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler, who will shepherd my people Israel. So again, a prophecy fulfilled by the birth of Jesus Christ. Now in verse 7, it says, Then Herod secretly called the Magi, and ascertained from them the time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. And when you have found him, report it to me, that I too may come and worship him. Yeah, right, buddy, right. Okay, now we, we know the rest of the story. So, yeah, we all want to worship him, too. Just let me know where he is. Okay, yeah, right. All right, now in verse 9, it says, And having heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. Now in verse 10, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they came into the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him, and opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Important gifts. I'm going to share that with you in a second. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, 
they departed for their own country by another way. And then we continue on in verse 13, but uh, uh, we'll see that uh, uh, maybe a little bit later on. But also in prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 23 in verses 5 and 6, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. Remember, David was that great king of Israel that God anointed to be the king of Israel. Even though he was to be king, the people wanted their own human king. God anointed David to be that, but then also blessed David because of the righteous man that he was, that he would have a son that one day would sit on the throne for all of eternity. And that son was now being born in Bethlehem. So when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In these days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous. And again, Yahweh is the Old Testament word, the Hebrew word for that. That is the name for the Lord, but it also means our God. But I also found interesting in all these passages about the prophecies of Jesus, we always see the word what? Righteous or righteousness associated with it as well. And then that word just too, which can again uh, be a synonymous term. Righteous and just, that's who he is. In other words, the perfection of who he is. Yes, as God, he is absolutely perfect. He is without sin. Jesus Christ came into the world without sin, remained sin, so that he could go to the cross to take on our sin. And so again, even that term righteous, we can identify that with God, because only God is righteous. There's none not none righteous, no, not one, only God. And so we recognize, even in that term, that Jesus Christ is our God. And in Zechariah 9.9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. So again, just, endowed with salvation. He is the Savior. And again, this was the prophecy of him coming, riding upon the donkey into Jerusalem in the week before he was crucified. So we get that prophecy, but again, your king is coming to you. And here he is, the person of Jesus Christ. So we see that uh, Herod said something interesting. You see, Herod's response regarding the king of Israel in verse 4, if you want, uh, to go back and read that, but I'll just uh, give it to you as well. It says, In gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he began to inquire to them where the Christ was to be born. And it's interesting that he used the word Christ because in some translations, that word is also Messiah. And he says, where is the Christ or where is the Messiah being born? You see, that was an important term for the Israelites back in the day. Their Messiah would come and save them. And so in recognition of Jesus Christ, where is the Christ going to be born? We recognize where is the Messiah going to be born? And so we've already seen the name Jesus means Savior. We know that he is the king because he is God incarnate, the king of Israel. He is the Savior, the King. He is also the Christ, the Messiah. And that's kind of interesting. Now, we look back at this and say, okay, that's the name that he was looking for, Jesus Christ. We know that name. It's very familiar to us. Christ, 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 right? It's familiar to us. But think about Herod, a staunch unbeliever, a ruthless, evil king. And we know the deception. Oh, tell us where he is so that we too can come and worship him. And then I didn't read the rest of the story. You can read that on your own. But he goes and kills all the babies in Bethlehem trying to get rid of this guy. A staunch unbeliever. But yet even he, a staunch unbeliever, knew and recognized the prophecies of old. Because what did he say? Where's the Messiah? Can you believe that? So when I read this, I was like, wait, what? He's the Messiah? This guy's recognizing him as the Messiah? Yes, he is. He's recognizing him as the Christ? Yes, he is, even though he doesn't believe in the Messiah, the Christ, or the Savior, because he was his own Savior. He was the king. So it's very, very interesting that we see this staunch unbeliever knew that the king of Israel, where's the king of Israel? Where's the Christ? So that I, too, may come and worship him. He knew he was the Messiah. And that's why, again, we have what we call during the age in which we live in the common grace ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. 
And the Holy Spirit works in the soul of every member of the human race so that they too can know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Savior. Maybe not the King, but that's okay if they don't know the kingship. But the Messiah and the Savior, everyone at one point comes to the conscious knowledge that Jesus Christ is these things. Now, whether they believe it or not is another story. But that's our role, to give them the information, tell them about who the Christ is, and help them to understand who that Messiah is. And the Holy Spirit will work with you so that you can help them to know that he is the Savior, he is the Messiah, who is also God with us. He is the King of Israel. So we see these great titles of Jesus Christ. He's the Savior, He's the Messiah, He's the King. And usually when I uh, put my notes together and I'm uh, uh, putting my lessons together and I'm talking about Jesus, I use this three-term phrase, Savior, Messiah, King. And I usually do it in that order, Savior, Messiah, King. But we also see something interesting in regard to the wise men because they brought gifts of what? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In that order in the Scriptures. And so basically what that does is kind of flip the last and the first from what I typically do. Savior, Messiah, King, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You see, they gave Jesus Christ this gift. They gave Mary and Joseph these gifts to recognize the person of who Jesus Christ is. And they knew, these wise men knew he was the Savior, the Messiah, the King. And so therefore they gave him these gifts to help the parents in their trouble and their flight, but to worship him for who and what he is. You see, gold represents who God is and also the king, okay? The kingship of Jesus Christ. That's why they gave him that gold, to recognize the king. Frankincense was an interesting type of incense that was beautiful, smelling, aroma, that talks about the life of an individual. And it talked about the life of Jesus as our Messiah. So gold and frankincense also identify by the gifts that he is God who is our Messiah. And he lived a life of perfection so that he could go to the cross to pay for our sins. And then that last one, myrrh, is a fantastic one because that was the old embalming uh, type of uh, uh, fragrant uh, or uh, anoint, uh, uh, anointing, but ointment that they used to use back in the day. You see, they used to embalm the bodies with that myrrh and cover it. We even saw and read recently in the death of Jesus Christ that they did that to his body when they buried him when they took him off the cross. So when they gave him the gift of myrrh, it was signifying his death, his eventual death as our Lord and as our Savior. Because we know the death of Jesus Christ on the cross when he hung there for those three hours and he was saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He died spiritually because he took on our sins and paid the penalty for them so that we would not have to. And then he said, it is finished, and he gave up his physical life. So again, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Fantastic gifts, very valuable at the time. And I'm sure Joseph and Mary used those so that they could be supported because we also see that they fled to Egypt for a while and then came back. It helped them in their flight. God helped them in the protection of this baby child that had no protection of its own, could not fight or defend for himself. But mom and dad were there along with a, a great uh, a divine providence from God to help them along the way. But in these gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, it's exactly what we read in the text. Call him Jesus. He is the Savior. He's going to die for our sins. Call him Emmanuel. God with us. He is the King of Israel. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. Where is the Christ? He is that too. And so all of these terms tell us about the person and work of Jesus Christ. And as we celebrate him coming into the world 2,000 years ago, every year on this Christmas time, and again, we shouldn't just do it on Christmas, we should do it every day of the year. Every day should be Christmas, okay? But you don't have to give gifts every day, all right? But just recognize the great gifts that were given to you through the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as designed in eternity past by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as we have one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who share, they're one God because their essence and attributes, they are the same, always have, always will be. An exact same representation. We have one God, and that one God made a plan billions of years ago to come into this world, 2,000 years ago, so that God could be with us, He could Emmanuel us, or He could Emmanuel, okay, 
and ultimately be our Messiah, lived a life of perfection so that he could go to the cross and be our Savior. So the gold, the frankincense, and myrrh were prophetic gifts that were given that speak about who Jesus Christ is. Now a couple of scriptures as we close this morning in regard to the more prophecy that we even see in the Old Testament. It says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, interesting, Eternal Father, even though it's Jesus Christ on this earth, Prince of Peace. And again, Mighty God is who Jesus Christ is, Eternal Father, He's one with the Father inseparable from the Father and the Holy Spirit. So again, he can be called that too, and the Prince of Peace. He broke down the dividing barri barrier between God and man so that we could be at peace with God. And by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have eternal peace with God. Your sins are forgiven and forgotten, and God has given you eternal life forevermore. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 32 through 33, in that prophecy in regard to the birth of Christ, or in that narrative, it says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. That phrase all by itself means that He's God. But it also says, And the Lord God will give Him the throne of His father David. So again, God the Father in the plan, giving it to the Son. And He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Why? Because He's the King and the King of Israel. And His kingdom will have no end. And you and I will be part of that kingdom for all of eternity because we have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And again, in Micah 5, 2, again, as for you, Bethlehem, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth for me to be the ruler of Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. And again, from eternity past, God designed a plan. He knew that we would be sinners. He knew that we would need salvation. And from eternity past, he put a plan together to provide us that through this individual that we celebrate every year. And that is the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we uh, get in, start tearing open those presents tomorrow, we start digging into, I don't know if you do turkey or ham or roast beef uh, or even the uh, roast beast, as they used to call it. Whatever you dig into tomorrow, again, with every opening, with every giving, with every bite and every morsel, recognize that your God and your Savior has come into the world so that you could have eternal life and live with him in great glory forever and ever and ever. All right, so let's just close in prayer right now. Father, we thank you for this time of celebration. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and him volunteering to come into the world 2,000 years ago and for your great plan for our salvation through him. That plan which no one else could accomplish, no one else could fulfill, and no one else could satisfy, but yet he did in the absolute perfect way. And we thank you, Father, for the tetelestai of the cross saying it is finished because no more has to be done. We do not have to work. We do not have to struggle. We do not have to plead or beg or barter or bargain. Our salvation is a free gift that you have given to us. And we thank you, Father, for that free grace gift. And we ask that we cherish that each and every day as we continue to walk in our relationship with you in glory. And so, Father, if there's anyone listening to my voice here today or on online, wherever they may be, I'm here to tell you that God the Father loved you so much that he sent his only son into the world so that he could go to the cross and pay for your sins. And he did so when he took on your sins and paid for them and then signified by giving his life. But yet the story doesn't end there because three days later he rose from the dead to show that sin no longer has a hold over man and death no longer has a hold over anyone. And Jesus Christ demonstrated the victory over sin and death by being raised on the third day. And so now all you need to do is recognize in your heart of your soul and say to God the Father, Yes, Father, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, and through him I have eternal life. And I offer you an opportunity to do so right now. And if you've said those words and truly believe them in your heart, I welcome you to the eternal family of God and look forward to the day that we're celebrating the birth and death of Jesus Christ for all of eternity collectively in the heavenly state. 
So, Father, we thank you for this celebration, this time, and we ask that you bless the closing portions of our service today. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right, thank you very much for that portion. And now uh, uh, to celebrate our Lord, we're going to celebrate communion. So if I could have uh, the guys come forward and uh, pass out our communion elements. Uh, Mike and Steve, you want to maybe, there's a lot of people, so maybe you could, I don't know if we have enough for everybody, but we'll start with these two guys and then see what we got. You go left, you go right. On two. Ready? Wait, where, where am I going, right or left? Follow him. You're going right. Yeah, and let me just do an o a prayer for the communion. And then we'll celebrate uh, this great feast. All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of celebration and remembrance and thanksgiving of your son, Jesus Christ, and all that he accomplished for us 2,000 years ago. And we ask that this time be meaningful and impactful in our celebration and glorifying to you and to he, all by the power of your Holy Spirit, in Christ's name. Amen. And well, before you go, somebody's going to sing a song. Who's going to sing a song? Okay, Amy, go ahead. Let's, go. Let's get set up. <laughs>